I want you to ask yourself a question. You know, what's going on in the tech world? Because and now we need to put the economics of water, not only in terms of monetary values, but also in terms of governance, in terms of, of recognizing water as a, as a commons that we now need to manage as a, as a broad systems approach. So that's why this commission is not only necessary, but, but urgent to take this challenge on. You know, not only have we not focused on economics of water, when we have focused on water, we've only focused on drinking water, domestic water, and that is roughly 150 liters per person per day, which is what, what the wealthy are using. It's a, it's a review on the economics of water, and we will be looking at the value of water and considering different novel economic policy measures, of which one may be, for example, putting some form of price on water in order to guide and, and give incentives, but not as a price to punish uh, those who are poor, but rather to reward those that are stewards of fresh water for the common good. So this is quite an exciting moment. Because we realize that the people in Silicon Valley, they're all partnered with the World Economic Forum and all the rest of these crazy people who have these agendas. And we know that these agendas that these people have aren't necessarily what's in our best interest. It's also, of course, true with COVID, right? We are all only as healthy as our neighbor is on our street, in our city, in our region, in our nation, and globally. And did we solve that? Like, did we actually manage to vaccinate everyone in the world? No. So highlighting water as a global commons and what it means to work together and see it both out of that kind of global commons perspective, but also the self-interest perspective, because it is it does have that parallel. It's not only important, but it's also important because we haven't managed <laughs> to solve those problems with, which had similar attributes. And water is something that people understand. You know, climate change is a bit abstract. Some people understand it really well. Some understand it a bit. Some just don't understand it. Water. Every kid knows how important it is to have water. When you're playing football and you're thirsty, you need water. So there's also something about really getting citizen engagement around this and really, in some ways, experimenting with this notion of the common good. Can we actually deliver this time in ways that we have failed miserably other times? And hopefully we won't keep failing on the other things, but anyway. So when we start looking at the agendas and what's going on, we have to start with the mentality of the people that are in that tech world because they're the ones that's getting the VC funding. You don't know what VC is, that's venture capital funding from the World Economic Forum. And then in turn, being the big brain scientists and engineers to turn around and do these things. But when you look at some of the inventions, you have to ask yourself a question. Why would you do such a thing? Now, I know you're sitting there saying, well, what the hell are you talking about? Let's start off with taking a look at some of the things that they're inventing. It's all public. It's all right in front of you. Let's just look at the things that they're highlighting for this week. We love to be able to take our pulses to know how healthy we are. But what if we can take the pulse of the ocean to know how healthy the ocean is? And as a result, how healthy our planet is. Today, that is extremely difficult. The reason it is difficult, it is very hard to deploy sensors in the ocean at scale. And so what we did is we developed a new camera that is about 100,000 times lower power than the lowest power cameras that exist. The ocean is the largest part of our planet, and yet it is the least explored part of our planet. Um, you could almost sense most of the Earth's surface. Once you go a few millimeters below the surface of the ocean, we've seen less than 5%. We sense less than 5%. And yet, we need to be able to sense the ocean in order for us to build better climate models and accurate climate models to be able to understand when, thing, when bad things are happening and be able to react to them before they actually happen in the ocean. One of the biggest challenges in aquaculture farms is the spread of diseases. Usually these are offshore. If disease happens and it spreads and you're not able to detect it early, it could wipe out an entire season. Why in the world do you need that? Why do you need to know every drop of water and how it's moving in the ocean? Now, the thing about actually growing food in space, okay, that makes sense. But why do you need to make medicine in space outside of jurisdiction of federal governments? Why, 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 why is any of this necessary? And how is it being done? Now, here's the most important thing. If you understand the mentality of the people 
who are getting the money to do this, then you will understand how this is being done. So let's take a look at what one of them had to say for themselves while they were talking with Tucker Carlson. You're going to find this real interesting. Legitimate concern. Absolutely. So what, I'm not, I'm not surprised that there are cults in Silicon Valley. I don't think you named the only one. I think there are others. That's my sense. And I'm not surprised because, of course, every person is born with the intuitive knowledge that there's a power beyond himself. That's why every single civilization has worshipped something. And if you don't acknowledge that, you just, it doesn't change. You just worship something even dumber. Yeah. But so my question to you as someone who lives and works there is what percentage of the people who are making decisions in Silicon Valley will say out loud, you know, not I'm a Christian Jew or Muslim, but that like, I'm, I'm not, you know, there is a power bigger than me in the universe. Do, do people think that? Do they acknowledge that? Yeah, you know, for the most part, no. Um, I thought. Yeah, like I think most, I don't, I don't want to say most people, but like, you know, the vast majority of the discussions tend to be like more intellectual. I think people just take for granted that everyone has like a secular, mostly secular point of view. Well, I think that, you know, the, the truly brilliant conclusion is that we don't know a lot and we don't have a ton of power. I mean, that's my view. Something, <laughs> right, right. So like the actual intellectual will over time, if he's honest, will reach. By the way, this is the view of like many scientists and many people who really went deep. I mean, I don't know who said it. I'm trying to remember, but someone said like the first gulp of science make you an atheist, but at the bottom of the cup, uh, you'll find God waiting for you. That's Matthias Desmet wrote a book about this, supposedly about COVID. It was not about COVID. I just cannot recommend it. Uh, more strongly but he, the book is about the point you just made which is the deeper you go into science the more you see some sort of order reflected that is not random at all yes and a beauty exhibited in um in math even uh and the less you know and the more you're certain that this is by that there's a design here mm -hmm. and that's not human or quote natural it's supernatural mm -hmm. That, that's his conclusion, and I affirm it. But do, how many people do you know in your science world who think that? Uh, yeah, I can count them on, on one hand, basically. Yeah, how yeah. interesting. Yeah. See what I mean? They have no belief in God. And it's not necessarily a belief in Jesus, Allah, or Buddha, or Vishnu, or whoever the hell they think there is no higher power and it's all science ideally you have people forming up opinions and desires and then voting for a government that represents them but we know it works both way the government has enormous power to shape the opinions and desires of the population mm -hmm. and this power only increases today with uh, the new technologies of surveillance and mass surveillance and social media and so forth so when the government can sh i mean the government is not just responsive to the will of the people it can shape the will of the people and this really destabilizes the democratic system mm -hmm. also you know the media has an enormous role to play in this that if the government has too much control over the media then it's not like people are forming their own independent views about what's happening. We now have the power, or at least not we, but some gov governments and corporations for the first time in history have the power to basically hack human beings. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers, hacking smartphones, hacking bank accounts, but the big story of our era is the ability to hack human beings. And by this I mean that if you have enough data and you have enough computing power, you can understand people better than they understand themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you can manipulate them in ways which were previously impossible. Mm -hmm. And in such a situation, the old democratic system stopped functioning. We need to reinvent democracy for this new era in which humans are now hackable animals. Not really realizing that the God that they're working for is science. Science is their God and nobody has the balls to tell them. So I'll say this to you gentlemen, you are very intelligent people who lack an ounce of common sense for you are serving a God. 
that God is science and technology. It doesn't mean that the future has to be bad. Uh, it, it, it's, it's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste because a crisis is an opportunity to also do re good reforms that in normal times people will never agree to. But in a crisis, you see we have no chance, so, 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 so let's do it. And That's what you serve. That's who you serve. But uh, you don't believe in God. And it's not something we discuss. Because if you had to sit there and think for one second outside of the box of the God that you serve, then you would have to consider how everything you do, you do affects everyone else. But you don't care about that, so it doesn't really matter. You serve technology and science and money. Other gods you serve is mammon. Now you may be saying, DW, what you talking about? You know, you always be ranting and raving. No, no. Let's go and see some of the more salacious things that these people are saying. It's important that you hear the salacious talk. So it can all hit home for you. Because if you don't hear the salacious talk, and by the way, YouTube, I'm not saying anything salacious. These are people who are on your platform who say these salacious things. They don't get banned. They don't get demonetized. Nothing happens to them. Here's, here's the king of saying crazy things. In the book, if I understand it correctly, you argue that actually the amazing breakthrough that uh, we are experiencing right now not only will potentially make our life better, but uh, they will create, and I quote you, new classes and new class struggles, just as the Industrial Revolution did. Can you elaborate for us? Yes, in the Industrial Revolution, we saw the uh, creation of a new class of the urban proletariat. And much of the political and social history of the last 200 years involved what to do with this class and the new problems and opportunities. Now, we see the creation of a new massive class of useless people. As computers become better and better in more and more fields, there is a distinct possibility that computers will outperform us in most tasks and will make humans redundant. And then the big political and economic question of the 21st century will be, what do we need humans for? Or at least, what do we need so many humans for? Do you have an answer in the book? Um, at present, the best guess we have is uh, keep them happy with drugs and computer games. So, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, when you understand that these people, and I do mean these people in Silicon Valley, they are godless people in any shape, form that you could ever understand, that's why things are the way they are. That's, but see, as long as science is your God, or money is your God, then you will do anything. You don't care who you hurt, who you harm. And that's how we end up with people like the people at the World Economic Forum. They are godless people. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. But there's a few people out here who may uh, happen to stumble upon this video and be saying, man, we'll just do the saying is right. I never thought about it that way. For you guys who are in the choir, you know this. I understand that. You, you get this. But those who are not in the choir... You may be saying to yourself, well, damn, I didn't know this. And that's the whole purpose of me making this video. It's for those people who will come into a knowledge that they've never known. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am out of here. On to the next video. Peace.